So we're going to talk today about some acute and chronic responses that we have to dynamic exercise. This is kind of seen as a review for people who have, take, uh, who have taken exercise physiology in the past, or it's kind of a preview or reminder for individuals who are currently taking exercise physiology and just kind of getting us up to date on some topics as far as what the responses we have to exercise might be. So a couple things we're going to take a look at, um, some cardiovascular adjustments that we have in order for us to actually maintain exercise within our bodies. Um, we're going to look at some autonomic functions um, that occur in order to give us an increased cardiac output. We're going to look at the redistribution of our cardiac output once it is produced, and then also increasing the extraction of our oxygen, uh, ex extraction of the oxygen by our working muscles. So let's go back to the Fick equation. So as we remember, our VO2, which is our oxygen consumption, is basically equal to what our cardiac output is times the difference between our oxygen content of our arterials, uh, of our arteries, and of our veins. What we know is our AVO2 difference. So it's usually um, measured in either absolute terms, which is liters per minute, or in relative terms, which is milliliters per kil kilogram per minute, in which we're taking into account what the body size of the individual is in order for us to compare across different individuals. Um, and then, however, we also want to throw in another type of a measurement when we start working with the clinical world and working with patients of what we usually move to is the terminology of a MET. And basically, it's a metabolic equivalent um, uh, measurement, and it equals, one MET approximately equals 3.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute, which is basically our resting basal metabolic rate. And this is what commonly is used within the clinical setting. So we're just going to become familiar with that term as well. So when we look at oxygen consumption, our VO2 max is basically the maximum ability of our cardiovascular system to transport oxygen to our working muscles during severe exercise. And it, for it to truly be a max test, we want to be using a large muscle mass, at least um, greater than or equal to 50% of our muscle mass within our body. So types of activities that we can think of, um, running on a treadmill is usually the most common way that it's tested. We can use um, other measurements such as like upper body ergometers or cycle ergometers, but often that gives us a VO2 peak instead of a T VO2 max just because it isn't using quite enough of our muscle mass, but it's often a good equivalent for us to be able to compare subjects across. So in this little chart that we have down at the bottom, what you can see is absolute VO2 for these different types of activities. So it's measured in liters per minute on the left-hand side, and we look at resting, walking at three miles per hour, running at six miles per hour, and then what our average fitness is, excellent fitness, and elite fitness. And taking a look um, right next to that are our numbers that kind of correspond with that. To give us some equivalence, when we take a look at um, adjusting for weight, we can kind of see the equivalent there, um, resting, if we see that 3.5 uh, milliliters per kilogram per minute, that's equivalent to one met, as we see in the parentheses. And if we jump down, if we just look at, say, average fitness, and we look at average fitness is approximately a 48 milliliter per kilogram per minute, or the equivalent of about 13.7 mets. Up to elite, we can get up to 75 milliliters per kilogram per minute. So this just gives us a kind of couple numbers for us to play with and kind of be able to compare when we start taking a look at our patients further down the road. When we look at this graph, we are looking at our work measured in watts along our x-axis, and then we have maximal oxygen uptake here on our y-axis, and what you notice is that in all of these different conditions, sedentary, normally active, conditioned, and in our endurance athletes, we see that there is an extreme linear relationship between our oxygen uptake and our workload, um, including our heart rate as well up to a certain point in which it then it plateaus right approximately around a maximum oxygen uptake that we have. Um, what we can see is that there is a range of what a VO2 max might be from less than 10 milliliters per kilogram per minute in our disease population up to over 85 milliliters per kilogram per minute in our elite athletes. And if I remember correctly, I want to say like Prefontaine was approximately like an 84. I think the highest recorded VO2 max ever if I remember correctly, it was a, co a cross-country skier, and it was approximately like 96 milliliters per kilogram per minute.
But what you notice on this graph is everything's going up linearly. It's just a matter of what the max is. So we see sedentaries that are stopping sooner, right around 30 milliliters per kilogram per minute, up to the athletes, which are more around 85. So it's just kind of looking at where our range is, but we all progress in the same linear fashion. So how do these different components of our FIC equation change when we're dealing with aerobic exercise? Well, one of the components we have was cardiac output, right? And we know that our cardiac output is equal to our heart rate times our stroke volume. So let's take a look at our heart rate and our stroke volume and find out what are our differences that occur with exercise then. So our heart rate response, <clears throat> so just as we are about to begin exercise, we have this sort of anticipatory response that happens even before we exercise, in which our heart rate will increase in order to prepare us for the exercise that's about to happen. This happens through um, a neural release of norepinephrine from our sympathetic nervous system, and epinephrine release from our adrenal medulla, which is attaching onto those beta-1 receptors that we have located on our heart in order to speed up um, our SA node um, and delay or remove the delay in our AV node that we have within our heart. So when we look at our heart rate response, at the onset of dynamic exercise, the first thing that we're going to see is a vagal withdrawal, right? This is our parasympathetic withdrawal, which will lead to an increase up to about 100 beats per minute. So when we take a look at this graph, we have our ox uh, maximal oxygen uptake going a percent wise from rest up to 100% on our x-axis. And we have our heart rate going from zero up to 200, which is um, hypothetically a maximum heart rate that we might have. We begin down in this vagus uh, portion in which we have this vagus withdrawal in order to to get our heart rate up to around approximately 100 beats per minute. At that point, when we have more activation of our um, of our brain, we need, in order to compensate for that, we start to activate our sympathetic nervous system, which will then increase our heart rate even above 100. So what I really do want to point out is that there is some overlap between these two systems. So you see, for a given maximal oxygen uptake and given heart rate right around this 100 beats per minute, you can see that there is overlap in which both the vagus and the sympathetic, or both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems can be actively involved. In fact, even as we get into higher levels of exercise, parasympathetic can still be playing an effect on there. It's just constantly withdrawing to try and increase that heart rate. So let's talk about what initiates the increase of our heart rate at the onset of our exercise. So <clears throat> we have this central command hypothesis, and it basically shows the idea that our motor outflow from our cerebral cortex during exercise will interact with some central neuron pools that regulate our cardiovascular responses. So Basically what happens is that when we are about to attempt exercise, it will prompt us to increase our heart rate, increase our, increase our ventilation, increase our blood pressure, and increase our alpha motor unit activation. And the question is, how do we know that this is actually a central command that's coming from within the brain to initiate these responses? How do we know it's not the contraction of our muscle or it isn't a buildup of metabolites that is um, occurring because of metabol uh, uh uh, the metabolic demand of the working muscle. We actually know that it's coming from within the brain itself because there's been experiments that have been done that actually administered a paralyzing agent called curare into working into muscles, uh, forearm muscles of individuals, and they were asked to try an exercise. And as they would begin to try and contract their muscles, but since they were being blocked and could not actually activate their muscles, we knew it wasn't coming from the muscles themselves, but instead we still saw a heart rate increase, ventilation increase, increase in blood pressure and such that was stemming from the brain. It's the only other place that it could be coming from. So we actually know that this is coming from the brain in order for us to try and protect the system by increasing all of these as we know the demand will need to be increased as we begin exercise. So basically how this happens is that we get a resetting of our barrel reflex. And you guys remember this from our 314 class that we've all taken and some in XFIS as well. So during exercise, our arterial barrel reflex is reset upward and to the right in order to defend a higher pressure. So what happens is we move from our, um, on our little graph that we have here, we have arterial pressure and we have the sympathetic nervous activity or our heart rate. You can put either one on here. We have the solid line, which is indicating at rest indicating that we are falling with on this graph. But as we begin exercise, we actually shift 
over to this dotted line, which basically um, shows us that or indicates to our body that we are at a low setting of our blood pressure. When normally it would be read at a normal pressure, it is now reading as that as, as we are having hypotension and it needs to increase our heart rate and increase contractility in order for us to increase our blood pressure as well. <clears throat> and then just so I want you to notice that there's no change in our baroreflex sensitivity as far as like what makes us follow along here. We, what we see basically is that both of the solid line and on the dashed line is that the slopes remain the same between the two curves, which indicates our sensitivity. So for a given change in arterial pressure, we'll still have the same change in our sympathetic nervous activity. It just will be at a higher amount of blood pressure that we're needing to make those changes. And just a quick review on how this actually happens. So our barrier reflex control that we have, when we are sensing that we have this drop in our arterial pressure indicated at the top of this flow chart, we have increased arterial baroreceptor activity. And what that's going to do is two different things. One thing it's going to do is withdraw the parasympathetic nervous system, which is acting by withdrawing on the vagus nerve, which will lead to an increase in our heart rate, which then also leads to an increase in our cardiac output. And at the same time, or seconds later, we're going to be in increasing our sympathetic nervous activity in order to increase both uh, a couple of different things. Here on the chart, we see that it's increased on our stroke volume. It also tends to increase our vascular resistance because of vasoconstricting in order for us to pump things through a little bit more quickly. And it also increases the actual speed of our heart as well on the beta-1 receptors. So we have these two systems that are kind of working together because it's sensing that we are at a lower arterial pressure because we're trying to defend this reset pressure. So since our parasympathetic withdrawal occurs virtually on a beat to beat basis and the sympathetic takes approximately like five to 15 seconds in order to activate. So we're just taking a look at our, heart, our resting heart rate affecting on our heart rate response and what this means as far as needing a warm up. So take a moment, Think about it, if we have a lower resting heart rate and we begin exercise, and we begin exercise very extremely quickly, what is that going to do based on what our heart rate needs to get up to that 100 beats per minute before our sympathetic activation takes place? So what I'm kind of thinking is that when we have a lower heart rate and it's going to take us a longer period of time in order to get up to 100 beats per minute. This is when a warm up is so crucial because it's going to take time as we are withdrawing that parasympathetic nervous system and then starting to move into our sympathetic activation that we need this warm up time in order to have enough of a parasympathetic withdrawal that then we start to see sympathetic activation that takes a longer period of time because if we were to have this lower heart resting heart rate begin maximum exercise right away, it would take this period of time of 5 to 15 seconds in which our blood pressure would drop so incredibly low, we might not be able to maintain standing or exercise at that period of time until the sympathetic activation can actually take place because it takes that long for our heart rate to get up. So it's just kind of a thought of why warm-ups are kind of important to go a little bit slowly at the beginning and not just break out in maximum running right away. As far as maximum heart rate, we do need to realize that it does decline with age. Usually a good estimate for a maximum heart rate is if we take the number 220 minus our age, and that's, it's reasonable within a period of, um, of heart rate. So you take a look at our standard deviation is usually about plus or minus 10. I happen to know that my maximum heart rate actually gets about 10 beats above what my predicted is based on my age. There's other factors that will affect our maximum heart rate, though. The type of exercise that we're doing, so some will elicit a higher heart rate than others. So it's the difference kind of between our VO2 max versus our VO2 peak. It's why we're more likely to see a maximum, an actual maximum heart rate on a treadmill versus when we're on like a cycle ergometer. Also, different disease states might actually stop us from being able to reach a maximum heart rate because our body cannot maintain that. Or different medications that we're taking. If, say, for instance, if we are on a beta blocker, it actually will limit the extent at which our maximum heart rate can increase and cap it usually around 130 or so beats per minute. <clears throat> 
And then just keeping in mind with our um, submaximum exercise at a constant workload, our heart rate will increase for about one to three minutes during each stage, but then it'll plateau to a steady state value at that time period. So whenever we're taking measurements, we always want to take them at uh, at this steady state waiting after the, about the first three minutes of an exercise stage. And then the exercise intensity really correlates with this time to plateau. The faster we work or the harder we're working, the more likely it is to reach that pl plateau a little earlier. So looking at stroke volume responses, we looked at heart rate. The other component we have of our cardiac output is our stroke volume. So with our stroke volume, it's basically the equivalent of taking our end diastolic volume minus our end systolic volume. So it's how much is leaving at our heart, how much blood is leaving our heart in each contraction. Our resting stroke volume can be anywhere between 60 and 120 milliliters per beat. That's in the healthy individual. And then when we add exercise onto that, it can actually reach as high as 200 milliliters per beat in elite athletes. Um, although there's not really a linear relationship between workload as we saw with the heart rate response or the oxygen consumption response. Instead, um, let's take a look at what happens with changes in our stroke volume with exercise. So in this graph, we have minutes of exercising going across our x-axis. You can kind of see the protocol that was used on the testing that we have here. We had the grade that was increasing from 10% to 12% up to 20% at each stage or each minute that was going up um, or set of minutes that was going up we also see an increase in our speed and our miles per hour ranging from 1.7 to 5.5 miles per hour and this is um, called the Bruce treadmill protocol and we'll take a look at this as we get into a little bit more um, exercise testing in a couple of weeks but what we see is on the y-axis is our stroke volume so we see there is an increase in our stroke volume with our workload up to a certain point, and that's usually right around our VO2 peak or our VO2 max. Then it tends to hit a plateau and might even slightly decrease at a high intensity exercise. But what you can see is chronically here um, between the sedentary male, the fit male, and the athlete is that we can actually reach higher stroke volumes chronically um, with, when we're endurance trained. So we're just kind of looking at that and looking forward to our chronic adaptations as well. So changes in what's happening. So why, why are we getting this change in our stroke volume when we are currently exercising? So we get an increase in the stroke volume with exercise as a result of an increase in our preload, an increase in our contractility, and a decrease in our afterload. So let's talk about how each of these different factors contribute to our stroke volume. So our preload is increased because we have more of a venous return, because we have more muscle that is pumping blood actively from the venous system back up into the heart. We will have more of a preload, which is basically the volume or the stretch of the heart prior to contraction. Because we are activating our sympathetic nervous system, we also get an increase in our contractility. So we have more blood in the heart and we can also contract it more forcefully. And because we are exercising, our total peripheral resistance tends to be a little bit lower, especially in the working muscle because we have vasodilation that's occurring. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So when we have more blood coming into the heart, we have more of a contraction and more force that's occurring, and we have less resistance on the other side, basically this difference between our end diastolic volume and our end systolic volume, as indicated here between rest and maximal exercise, we get an increase. As far as the determinants, remember we did talk about that it's the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume. Things that affect our end diastolic volume is our venous return, and that's depending on our muscle pump in order to return blood from the periphery back to the heart again. Um, this is pretty important when we're thinking about a cool down because we don't want to stop exercising immediately because as we stop that muscle pump, we're going to decrease our venous return. However, if we have been increasing our cardiac output because we have an increase in our heart rate and an increase in our stroke volume, all of a sudden all of our blood is going to be sitting down with gravity down in our legs and we could potentially pass out. So cool downs are pretty important with exercise, especially in the disease state, but even in not, in order for us to slowly cool the system down in order to decrease that heart rate before we actually stop using the muscle pump by stopping exercise. So nice slow walks after jogs or running is pretty important. <clears throat> 
Also, our filling time is very dependent on our heart rate because as our heart rate increases, our filling time will actually be reduced. And so that's another effect that we have on our end diastolic volume. On our end systolic volume, there are some other factors that are coming into play. We have the preload that's coming in, um, which causes more ventricular stretching. And as there's more stretch, you can actually get more of a contraction. And that's kind of the uh, Frank Starling have right there. And then just reemphasizing that. It also depends on our venous return on this length tension relationship, which is, uh, remember, limited by our pericardium. And there's a little note here to talk about dogs, and if you guys remember the stories of the greyhound dogs, in which in order to get over that restraint of the fibrous pericardium, which wouldn't allow our hearts to stretch enough, they could actually slit those in the greyhounds in order to have more of a preload, which would give us more of a stroke volume in order for them to actually perform better in races. So it's just a reminder of that. So this is our Frank Starling relationship. We have stretch indicated as our end diastolic volume in milliliters going across to our x-axis. And we have our stroke volume here on our y-axis. And it's basically indicating a slightly curvilinear relationship in which as you have more stretch or more blood or more end diastolic volume in the heart before contraction, it will actually produce a higher stroke volume. Um, also, it is affected by our afterload. So the force, our afterload basically is the force of the ventricle that's required in order to open the semi, uh, the aortic semilunar valve in order to inject blood into the systemic circulation. And as we increase our peripheral resistance, it increases this afterload or this resistance, and therefore it can reduce our stroke volume. Um, this is a condition such as like hypertension when we have high blood pressure. Just a quick note on ejection fraction because it will come up later in the term. Our ejection fraction is basically a ratio of what our, our blood leaving our heart versus the blood that was in our heart to begin with. So we take our stroke volume and divide it by our end diastolic volume and it gives us a percentage. So we multiply that by 100 to get our percentage. In the normal healthy adult, it's approximately 65%. What we'll see is and sometimes in our cardiac patients, it can get as low as like 20% or so in congestive heart failure as well. So it is significantly reduced due to different pathologies such as congestive heart failure, um, although a lot of times it's emphasized a little bit too much because as our ejection fraction starts to decrease, we actually will make compensations in order to uh, work around that, and so we'll adapt other things in our body. But we'll talk about that as we get into congestive heart failure in the future. And then just as a note, when we're exercising in the horizontal position, such as like swimming, our venous return really isn't working against gravity. So our stroke volume tends to be a little bit higher and the heart rate tends to be a little bit lower than when we're in the upright posture um, and exercising at any given intensity. So as far as exercise prescription ramifications, things to think about is that if our patient needs to be kept at a lower heart rate because maybe they have a high resting heart rate to begin with, um, or because of disease conditions, we might want to consider putting them more into this horizontal position when they're exercising in order to aid us at this blood return in order to get venous return uh, increased in the system. So as far as cardiac output in general, the average resting cardiac output is around 5 liters per minute. This could increase to about 20 to 40 liters per minute depending on your fitness level and the muscle mass size and the body size of who's exercising. The cardiac output will rise linearly with the workload, just like our heart rate did and our oxygen consumption. Um, however, at about 40% to 60% of our VO2 max, so right around the halfway point of our VO2 max, any further increases in our cardiac output are primarily due to increases in our heart rate. Because remember, we saw back on the previous graphs that our stroke volume really increases till about that period, about 50% of our VO2 max, and then we'll plateau at that period. So all the rest of our increases that we see linearly are because of increases in heart rate. And then just to know, our cardiac output, as far as what our oxygen delivery capacity is, tends to be what the limiting factor is in our VO2 peak or our VO2 max when we're dealing with our highly trained athletes. So that's usually the limiting factor there. This kind of gives them a rationale behind what the blood doping is because if we can take red blood cells and inject them into their blood, we have a higher capacity for them to carry more oxygen, which um, will then increase their VO2 max as we start to do that. And so there's been quite the controversy, and as of right now in different races, it is still illegal for us to be doing blood doping at this time.
when we look at our blood flow distribution, so we talked about our cardiorespiratory um, increases that we have there and things that change. But now let's talk about where does all this blood go. So at rest, about 20% of our cardiac output will go to the muscles. Um, during exhaustive exercise, you can get close to 90% delivered to the working muscle with blood being redirected away from our inactive regions, such as our liver and our kidneys and such. So when we take a look at this graph here, we have oxygen uptake going across the x-axis. So we're going basically from resting to a pretty high VO2 max there. And we have the cardiac output to the different uh, regions of the body there. So overall and generally, you see that there's an upward trend showing that we do have an increase in cardiac output as we talked about with exercise. What I want you to pay attention is the relative differences between the different types of tissue. So when we start at skin, which is our black lines that we have here, what we can see is it's pretty small as far as how much is going to skin when we're at like uh, 0 0.25 liters per minute. We'll see a slight increase in that as we see a bulging in that black line that's represented there. But then as we taper off and get to VO2 max, we actually see a decrease into that. So with our skin, when we're exercising, we go from rest in which there isn't a whole lot of blood flow to in the middle of exercise, we have more of a blood flow indicated by that bulge. And that's basically for us to try and cool down the body. We are bringing more of our blood to our skin surface in order to release that heat. But then as we are diverting blood this way, Way, it might sacrifice our working muscles. So if we continue on to a VO2 max, we actually see a decrease in the amount of blood going to the skin again. Well, you'll notice on the line underneath that, the kind of solid white, we have the heart and the brain. The brain will always stay absolute as far as how much is going, how much, uh, how many liters per minute are moving to the brain. And that's basically because we cannot have more blood going to the brain. We think about the skull and the constraints between the blood vessels in the skull. There isn't a whole lot of room to increase blood flow. And so we actually will keep that very constant. The relative percentage of our blood distribution to the heart will stay pretty constant about four to five percent, although we'll have a higher volume of blood and that can actually increase to about fivefold. So we do see the same percentage of blood going to the heart. Um, it is a working muscle. I think it's pumping as, as we are working, um, but the volume will actually increase. Now when we take a look at the slashed line that's underneath that in the viscera, these are all of our organs. When we talk about like our liver and our kidneys and our spleen and places that really don't need blood, all of our intestines and gastrointestinal system. So at rest, it's picking up a pretty good portion. So at the 0.25 uh, liters per minute of oxygen uptake at rest, you can say like it's a good portion of our cardiac output. But you'll see that those two lines come together pretty closely as we move up on those dotted lines to be taking up a fairly small percentage of our cardiac output and decreasing in our cardiac output as we are reaching our maximal exercise. And then underneath that we have our muscle, and this is our working muscle here. So it starts out pretty relatively low, underneath two liters per minute for our cardiac output, and it will steadily increase as we are moving more towards our VO2 max, getting up to about 18 liters per minute. So that's where a good portion of our blood flow is going. Now we do have some feedback and other reflexes that are coming from our active muscles. We have both a muscle mechanoreflex, which is simply the contraction or stretching and compression of our muscles, which are causing changes within our heart rate and our uh, blood pressure as well. So that's another feedback system that we have. And we also have the chemoreflex. We're going to explore this in a little bit more detail. But as metabolites are produced with exercise, for example, like lactic acid, we need to clear those out of the system and bring in more oxygen into the system. So that's called our muscle chemo reflex. So here in the center of the screen, we've got our blood vessel. We have the lumen indicated in blue, and we've got the endothelium and kind of the lighter orangish yellow, and then the orange is the vascular smooth muscle. We've got the sympathetic vasoconstrictor nerve that's coming in. Remember when we're exercising that we actually are having um, an activation of our sympathetic nervous system, right? So we're releasing norepinephrine in order to come here. Now what normally happens when norepinephrine is coming and attaching on to our receptors, our alpha receptors, we're going to get a vasoconstrictor. However, we also have these vasodilators indicated in the box, such as nitric oxide, prostaglandins, adenosine, ATP, potassium, uh, hydrogen, increase in carbon dioxide, decrease in O2, osmolarity. All these things are coming into play to want to actually vasodilate the muscle. It's acting, and these different substances act on the vascular smooth muscle, they'll act on those alpha receptors, and they'll actually um, act on the neuron that's releasing our norepinephrine 
in order to try and actually dilate our blood vessels instead of constricting them. And it's this competition between the local vasodilator mechanisms, which will try to ensure enough adequate uh, blood flow in order to meet the metabolic demand of the working muscle to compensate with trying to maintain blood pressure through the vasoconstriction. So really just indicated at the bottom, it's this balance between this vasoconstrictor influence of our sympathetic nervous system and this vasodilator influence of all of the metabolites that are building up and the need for oxygen within this that are kind of all coming into play. And, it, and our body has to balance these somehow in order to make sure we have enough blood flow, but we can still maintain blood pressure at the same time. We also have um, the other components. So we talked about our cardiac output. We talked about the redistribution of our cardiac output and how those changes happen. Now we've also got the other component of our FIC equation, which was the arteriovenous oxygen difference, so our AVO2 difference. It's basically the difference of the amount of oxygen carried in the arterial blood and the amount in the mixed venous blood returning back up into the heart. Essentially, it's a measure of our oxygen extract extraction by our tissues. So at rest, our arterial O2 content is usually about 20 milliliters per 100 milliliter, milliliters of blood. Our mixed venous O2 content is usually 15 milliliters uh, per 100 milliliters of blood, which gives us a difference of about 5 milliliters per 100 milliliters of blood, um, which is equivalent to about a 25% 25 extract, 25 extraction rate by our tissues. During maximum exercise, our venous O2 content can drop to about 2 to 5 milliliters per 100 milliliters of blood, which will widen this AVO2 difference to about 15 to 18 milliliters, which is indicating about a 75 to 90 percent extraction. So let's take a look at this with blood vessels and do a little more uh, picturesque description of it. So we've got venous blood that are returning back to the right side of the heart through the vena cava, and it's returning um, blood from either the exercising muscle, which will have a fairly low oxygen content as indicated by this blue vessel here. And then we also have blood returning from tissues that are less metabolically active that have a higher O2 content. So our inactive muscles or maybe where we're vasoconstricting, um, such as in our splanchnic region, in the, in the liver and the spleen and our intestines and that. And this contribution, you can see that if we're using a large muscle mass, we have a larger blood vessel diameter in our, in our blue indicating that there's a, a high amount uh, blood that's returning from this working muscle versus the smallerness of this red on the left hand side of the 15 milliliters of the inactive you can see that there's relatively little portions in our body that are metabolically inactive it has the lower uh, who has the higher oxygen uh, content returning back in the blood when you average these out and take into consideration how much blood is coming from each of these different regions the mixing uh, the resulting mixture of blood will have an o2 content that's somewhere between these two levels now, depending on how much working muscle we're using, it's going to indicate how low this number will be. So when we take a look at this difference, we get this widening gap between our O2 content and the mixed venous O2 as represented by this AVO2 difference. So when we look at the oxygen uptake going across in our x-axis, and we have the oxygen content within the blood of milliliters per minute, um, what we'll see is that starting at rest, which is indicated by R, this difference between the two gray, so we're looking at the white area between the two gray spots, is relatively little. We're looking at maybe like a 5 milliliter per 100 milliliter difference, maybe from 15 to, or a little below 15 to a little below 20. But as we start to exercise, this will widen, indicated over on the right hand side, looking at the systemic arterial venous O2 difference. So the ability of our muscles to extract oxygen for a given amount of blood flow tends to be the limiting factor when we're dealing with our low fit subjects. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So what do we see with our blood pressure? So our systolic blood pressure will increase in proportion to our workload, mainly through a rise in our cardiac output, usually about 8 to 12 uh, millimeters of mercury for each met. Our total peripheral resistance, however, will decrease with exercise, usually due to the dilators of the blood vessels within the active muscles. Um, so the more muscles that we're using, the more that's being dilated, which will actually decrease that total peripheral resistance a little bit. Our diastolic blood pressure tends to stay fairly steady or might drop just slightly with exercise because of um, 
this decrease in our peripheral resistance in competition with, with the vasoconstriction that's happening. So when you look at the pulse pressure, which is that difference between our systolic blood pressure and our diastolic pressure, you're going to see a widening or an increase in that, um, which is really much uh, pretty parallel to our systolic blood pressure and to our workload. When we take a look at our mean arterial pressure, remember that's the average pressure exerted by blood against the walls of the artery. And there's two different ways we can calculate that. Um, when we really look at it, it really is equivalent to our cardiac output times our total peripheral resistance. However, those are somewhat hard for us to measure within the lab without being too invasive, especially our cardiac output. So another way that we can calculate that without having to do invasive measurements is to take one third of that pulse pressure difference, which is that systolic blood pressure minus our diastolic blood pressure and then add that to our diastolic blood pressure and that gives us a good equation of our um, mean arterial pressure. And I just want to do a little bit of a note here that shows um, the importance of our systolic blood pressure when we are exercising. If we were to see a significant decline in our systolic blood pressure, which is greater than 10 millimeters of mercury during a steady state um, or a graded exercise, that would be grounds for us to actually stop our patients from exercising or our clients from exercising if we see that drop in our blood pressure in response to exercise. So last thing I want to talk about is our chronic adaptations that we see with our endurance exercise. So over here on the left hand side you see um, different parameters that might be affected in our cardiovascular system and we're looking at the difference between non-trained individuals and endurance trained individuals either at resting as our first column, submaximal exercise in our middle column, or maximal exercise on our right. So what do we see with our oxygen consumption? At rest there's really not a change between our, our basal metabolic oxygen consumption between a trained individual and a non-trained individual. But when we take a look um, at our maximal exercise, we will see an increase in that oxygen consumption. So remember, submax is also a no change because everybody is rising linearly, right? Remember we saw at the beginning of the presentation where we had workload going across our x-axis and oxygen consumption on our y-axis. We all raise at the same rate. However, we can reach more maximal efforts in oxygen consumption as we're more trained. As far as our heart rate, with our resting heart rate, we actually will see a decrease as we are chronically or um, endurance trained. It also gives us a decrease for each workload that we're performing at during our sub-maximal uh, exercise. And then as far as in maximal exercise, we're really not going to see very much of a change in our heart rate because we all reach the same maximal heart rate um, at the same time. So once we hit maximal exercise and have a maximal heart rate, that's more dependent on age than it is on training status. When we look at our stroke volume, remember we saw that we have chronic adaptations that happened as well. So we, in resting, submax, and maximal exercise, will have an increase in our stroke volume across the board when we are endurancely trained. When we take the heart rate and the stroke volume results combined, our cardiac output um, at resting, there's not really a change, neither at submaximal exercise, but there is an increase in our cardiac output at the maximal exercise. When we take a look at the active muscle blood flow, we saw that there isn't really a change at resting. However, uh, when we're doing any kind of an exercise, submaximal or maximal exercise, we'll have more blood flow going to the active working muscle. And primarily, that is through building up more capillaries in the actual muscle bed. Ventilation, there's really not a change at rest. Um, when we're exercising, there might be a slight decrease in our respiration, and then we actually have an increase in our respiration at maximal exercise. And then we took a look at our AVO2 difference. There really isn't a change at resting. Everybody stays pretty much the same, whether they're trained or not. Um, during submax exercise, you will see a slight increase and then a pretty big increase in our difference uh, with maximal exercise. And then also our lactic acid levels as far as how much... Uh, uh, metabolizing is occurring. At resting, there really isn't a change. A slight decrease at submax indicated that we can actually improve our threshold that we have for our lactic acid or our onset of blood lactate accumulation. And then at maximal exercise, we're actually increasing more lactic acid. So VO2 peak via improved oxygen uh, delivery and extraction with exercise training. We get a resting heart rate reduced, so it's just kind of emphasizing a couple of things, through increased parasympathetic control and an increased stroke volume. 
Also, the stroke volume will increase uh, because of heart size, because of contractility, and also because we increase our plasma volume as we begin exercising and are endurancely trained. And then our cardiac output will increase via enhanced stroke volume as well. So looking, this is just kind of re-emphasizing blood flow to the active areas is really coming from a capillary density and redirection of our blood flow. So we're looking at a normal person versus a conditioned person here on the two different graphs and looking at the blood flow. Everything else is staying pretty much the same. What's going to the organs, to the brain, to the skin, to other regions, and to the heart are pretty equivalent across the board between the normal individual and the conditioned individual. But then take a look at these white bars on the top and look Look at the difference between the blood flow to the working muscle and the normal individual versus the condition. We can see there is a significant increase when we're endurancely trained. <clears throat> Coming back to our blood vessels, when we took a look at our AVO2 difference, now instead of looking at the black numbers, let's look at the orange numbers for our endurancely trained individual, in which we have more capillaries heading to the muscle beds themselves, and so we have more oxygen that's being delivered, and we have more oxygen turnover at that point, in which the blood flow that's returning from our exercising muscle will actually have a lower O2 content than the non-trained individual. So when we take that in coordination with the 15 milliliters of oxygen that's pretty much staying constant in the inactive regions, the resulting mixture of our blood that will actually have a lower O2 content in our mixed venous blood, um, which is indicating that greater AVO2 difference again. A couple other chronic adaptations that are occurring with our endurance exercise. We get increased myoglobin content, which can help us to aid in oxygen delivery to the muscle mitochondria. We also get an increase in our volume of slow twitch or oxidative muscle fibers. We get a reduction in our blood pressure if we were hypertensive to start with. We haven't been able to show it in the normal tensive individual, but in hypertensive individuals, we actually get a reduction in our blood pressure. And a study that was recently done uh, in the last two years in the Halliwell lab actually showed that that can be with just two weeks of steady walking every day that you can get those reductions in blood pressure. We also get an improvement in our thermal regulation with a chronic exercise or endurance exercise trained. We get increases in our high density lipoproteins and a decreases in our, de in our triglycerides, an increase in our lean body mass and a decrease in our body fat. Um, a maintenance or actually an increase in our bone density and ligament and tendon strength. So it's actually good for our muscles and bones as well and connective tissue. And uh, some important factors that we don't often consider within our department but are definitely there is you get an enhanced self-confidence and independence as you're able to move around the world a little bit more easily, especially going from the disease state into one that's maybe a little bit less affected because you have been exercising. And it also helps to reduce the anxiety and the stress. And then as a last very note, chronic adaptations that happen to resistance exercise, so lifting weights. There's a long list that you can see here, and you can even pause the video if you want to take a look at the different changes that might happen. But just to kind of highlight ones that are a little bit more clinically rele relevant is that you get an improved functional capacity um, because of gains in your strength and in your endurance. You get improved recruitment patterns and synchronization of your motor units, so you're a little bit more coordinated and you can um, have a little bit more strength because of that. You get improved balance and coordination, and this actually will help to decrease the number of falls that your patients might have. You get an increase in your lean body mass and a decrease in your fat as well with your resistance training, just like we did with our cardiovascular training, and also a maintenance of our bone density and bone strength, just like we saw with our cardiovascular endurance train. And then a slight transformation of our type 2B fibers towards more of the type 2A fibers on the continuum. And then also more of the enhanced independence and quality of life um, can come with the resistance exercise as well.